Hey, folks. Welcome back to Sorry What. I'm Jason, your favorite storyteller. Ready for today's story? Well, go grab your favorite drink, find a chill spot, and let's dive right into it. Like honey drawing flies, such was the attraction of the online social networks, starting in the first decade of the 21st century. Millions, and eventually billions, of accounts were created across competing networks. No one knew how many were actually real. To some of us, though, those networks were like vinegar. We had no interest and didn't care to give them a try. My teenage daughter, Susie, on the other hand, couldn't wait to join, and my wife, Trisha, signed off on her request shortly after her 13th birthday. I wasn't too happy about it, but Trisha was a wonderful mother and generally made the right calls. Several weeks passed before, at dinner one evening, Susie asked if Trisha and I would like to join, too. Sure, sweetheart. That sounds like fun, said Trisha. Um, not me, thanks, I replied, hoping that would be the end of it. Susie wasn't done, pressing her case to get both of us involved. It's loads of fun, daddy. You can see what all your friends are doing and there's lots of games you can play. Sweetheart, I talk to my friends, either in person or on the phone. I don't need to go to a website for that. And we've got plenty of games here at the house if I want to play something. Daddy, what about Aunt Linda? When was the last time you spoke with her? Oh, I said, stalling, trying to remember when. I think it was a couple of weeks ago. Did you know she got a new car? Six weeks ago. It's red and looks really cool. Beth, her cousin, will be getting Aunt Linda's old car when she gets her license in a few months. You're friends with Aunt Linda on there. And she got a new car. I was a bit surprised, thinking her old one wasn't all that old. Trisha nodded, smirking at that surprise in my expression, though part of that had to do with the horrible thought of my niece driving on real roads, rather than around their church parking lot. Yeah, Susie replied, looking at me like I was crazy for not knowing. Told you you should join. Trisha and I talked about it that night. I guess I shouldn't have been too surprised when Trisha took Susie's side, especially considering she'd already given our girl permission to join and agreed to her own account. Trisha told me, she may be right. It might be a good way to keep in touch with our relatives and some of our old high school and college friends. Not sure I'd want to keep in touch with a lot of them, I groused. I already kept in touch with my better male friends. The girls were a different story. Most of the girls in high school had treated me either like dirt or like a brother usually an immature younger one, at that and most of the thousands of co-eds at college had just flat out ignored me. Of course, at such a large school, there were exceptions, and it got better, at least to a degree, as my education advanced. I had a number of female friends from college and even a couple of ex-girlfriends from my junior and senior years. Therefore, we decided to give it a try, though, secretly, my primary reason was to keep a close eye on Susie's online activities. I'd heard there were a lot of people trying to take advantage of young girls, so I was determined to keep that from happening to my daughter. I watched Susie's account closely and, quite happily, I saw that she was every bit as level-headed as we'd raised her to be. Eventually, feeling better about her activities, I spent some time locating and reuniting with old friends, but I was very careful to avoid my old lovers, in order to avoid upsetting my wife. There weren't that many since, other than a couple of cases of being in the right place at the right time, they were all former girlfriends, except for that one young lady in the adjacent building when I was in grad school. She'd be called a friend with benefits nowadays, since we got together to drink wine, hang out, and make out and more a few times. I figured old crushes that were only crushes were okay, as long as neither they nor Trisha knew about my former feelings. I eventually found Hallie, one of my relatively few female friends from freshman and so for more years. She was a good friend as well as being an unknowing and unrequited crush, but I'd been really careful to always maintain our relationship as just friends, rather than straying into an attempted romance that would, based on my past experience, result in our friendship being ended forever. Therefore, she played my heartstrings repeatedly without even knowing it until we eventually started drifting apart during the latter part of our junior year. By then, I'd started to have more success with other girls, and Hallie's slow drift away wasn't too noticeable until it was too late. With neither of us having ever entered into the danger zone, I felt a renewed friendship with her, as the mature adults we now were rather, wouldn't be a problem, so I sent her a hello note and a friend request, and then looked forward to her reply. When it came several days later, I was quite surprised. Tom Jared. I'm sorry but I don't remember ever knowing anyone by that name. You must have your wires crossed and be confusing me with someone else. She had a very good sense of humor in college, so, after the initial surprise, I realized she was playing a joke on me. Good one Hallie. You had me believing you for a second. How have you been? The next time I came back to the computer, there was a response. 
Sorry, I'm not joking. I really don't remember you. You had the wrong person. Talk about a kick in the teeth. Well, we hadn't spent much time together during senior year. We had a couple of classes together freshman and so for more years before she switched majors. I wasn't sure, but thought it might have taken her an extra semester or two to graduate as a result. Maybe she really wasn't thinking about our years together, so I decided to send a little reminder. Remember that time we went to the Delta Lamb party with Mark and Christy, Christy? Something like that. You twisted your ankle when you stepped off the front porch of the house, and I carried you piggyback all the way back to your dorm. We iced your ankle and you promised me a back massage when you felt better. By the way, I don't think I ever got to collect on that. It was a whole week before she responded that time. Sorry, you have me confused with someone else. I've never hurt my ankle like that, and I wouldn't promise a back massage to anyone other than a very close boyfriend, because of what it almost always leads to. Please don't contact me again. Well, that hurt, probably a lot more than it should have. I spent the next couple of days stewing, and then decided that since she sent a final message, I deserved one, too. Figuring that it might be pushing the bounds of creepiness or even stalkerhood, I'd make it clear in my message that it would be my last, and I wouldn't bother her again. Therefore, I spent the next couple of days writing and refining my message to convey exactly what I wanted to say, while I searched through some boxes in the basement for something I thought I remembered. Dear Hallie, it's probably for the best that you don't remember me, and that we won't be friends again because, in truth, it would probably violate the agreement I have with my wife about avoiding those who were once special to me. Well you never knew of the crush I had on you, I do and it would feel strange lying to my wife if she were to ask the nature of our friendship. Or, maybe you do and that explains your reluctance to say hello. Either way, I understand and won't contact you again, but I pray that you have a long lifetime of happiness and good health. Your friend at a distance forever. Tom. I attached a photo I'd found in my college photo album of the two of us with a couple of friends at a party when we were sophomores. She could deny it, but that picture was absolute proof that we knew each other and, as close and relaxed as we were together, that we'd been friends. After I sent that final message, Hallie never responded and I was true to my word, never sending her anything else. I put the photo album back in the basement and resolved to be more careful about reaching out to anyone who Trisha might find objectionable due to anything that might have happened in our past, whether it really had or not. Despite the care I took to avoid re-entangling myself with former romantic partners, my wife didn't. She ran into one of her ex-lovers the following summer while on a business trip to Chicago, and they reconnected then and more frequently in the months that followed. Perhaps she meant for me to find proof of the game she was playing, or maybe she just got sloppy, but the trust built up over nearly 17 years together was shattered, with our marriage along with it. Susie was saddened by the breakup of our family, but she still loved us both, and came to accept it eventually as she split her time between Trisha and me. We still did daddy-daughter things together quite often, and I was happy to see her becoming an intelligent and beautiful young woman with great opportunities ahead of her. With Susie actually living with Trisha most of the time, and with me eventually recovering from the initial shock of Trisha's infidelity and the pain that followed, I'd gone through a period where I'd sown a good bit of winter wheat or whatever the hell the term is for a hopefully somewhat more mature individual than those typically associated with wild oats. I'd even had a couple of girlfriends over the years that followed, but it wasn't long before I decided that clingy was better with plastic wrap than with girlfriends trying to wrap up a new husband. About seven years later. Hello. Hey Tom. It's Andy Reiner. How are you? Hi Andy. Great to hear from you. I'm doing well, and you? Andy and I hadn't talked much in recent years, but we swapped cards and a few notes to catch up every Christmas. Never better, my friend. Say, have you heard about our upcoming class reunion? 25 years, can you believe it? Gloria and I are thinking about attending, but we're trying to see if any of our old friends are coming. We don't want to get stuck at a table by ourselves with a group of virtual strangers if none of our closer friends show up know what I mean. Yeah, I skipped our 20-year reunion for that very reason, I admit it, though that wasn't the only reason. It was shortly after the divorce was finalized, and I really didn't feel like talking about it if I ran into any friends and definitely not with strangers. You have a list of people attending. Well, right now, in addition to Gloria and me, we've got yeses from Mark Savin, Keith and Gabby Schilling. He named off about 10 or 12 people I was friends with including Mark, who'd been my best friend and best man, and three couples, some of whom were definites with the rest considering it, but not yet sure. That was enough for me though, so by the time he was done, I'd made up my mind. Sounds like a great group and I look forward to seeing everybody. Put me down as a yes. I'll go register after we hang up. It's an October at homecoming, so we've still got three months, but Gloria and I look forward to seeing you there. Please tell her I said hello, my friend. 
Look forward to talking to you again soon. 20 minutes later, I was signed up to attend, including some of the special activities and the homecoming game versus the cats. I stepped on the scale later that evening, and set a goal to work off 10 pounds by the reunion. That would still put me about 15 pounds or so above my college weight, but should make me look pretty good. Reunion weekend arrived and there were 10 of us in our group that had promised to attend. Mark and I were the only ones who were single, though Mark did it legitimately, having never married. Larry and Ina were both on their second marriage after bailing out of their first within just a few years of tying the knot the first time. Keith and Gabby had married right after graduation, showing everyone else who was still on their first and only marriage, the way to do it. It was depressing to me that I wasn't, too, despite my plans. There were a number of activities on Friday, so I flew in on Thursday afternoon, and several of us got together for dinner that evening, and then drinks later that night in the hotel bar. Mark and I had been sweetmates during our sophomore year and had remained good friends, so we hung out together while talking with members of our group and a number of other people who came and went as the evening progressed. We attended some of the campus tours and seminars on Friday with some of our couple friends. Campus had changed a lot, with some new buildings, new artworks, and was, in many ways, still the same, with the plaza still filled with pretty young coeds flirting with the young men, while many others, of both sexes, rushed by, trying to make it to class on time. I remember those days, said Mark. Talk to the girl until the last second and then run to class. Yeah, they talk to you, I laughed. Did you see the note in the reunion brochure about the pizza place next to campus? Still there, but under new ownership. I wonder if they've redecorated. Redecorated. I wonder if the pizza still tastes the same. We texted everyone in our group and met there for pizza and beer. Some of the photos in the front lobby dated from before our years at school, but many others, including athletes and the famous who'd visited campus but stopped by for a slice and the beer, were new. Unfortunately, it seemed that about half of the reunion crowd had the same idea, so the wait was long, but that gave everyone a chance to talk and relax. Josh and Stephanie told us about their recent European tour after selling their firm, and Gloria told us about her new book that was being published. Mark was just starting into his story when someone caught his eye and he excused himself, going to catch up with her. It was Jane Miller, Mark's old crush from freshman and sophomore year. The rest of us watched from a distance as about 29 years after their first meeting, they finally hit it off. After pizza that was good but not quite as good as we remembered, I went to a couple of the afternoon activities by myself. Mark never showed up for dinner, and none of us saw Jane either. I smiled at the thought of them running into each other, and actually connecting after so many years, and briefly crossed my fingers for them for luck. We had a nice meal and talked, only taking a break to sort of pay attention when the class bigwigs got up to give their speeches. There were all the usual ones, welcoming us, recognizing special guests, making a fundraising pitch, reflecting on our class, making another fundraising pitch, and so on. The people at most tables started whispering during the second or maybe third request for funds, and most of us ignored the speakers for the rest of the time. They eventually got the hint and shut up, allowing the music to start. With that I got up for another drink and circulated around the big ballroom, stopping to speak with a few old friends along the way. When I eventually got back to the table, I danced with Gabby a couple of times when Keith, who put on way too much weight, complained of being tired. There was a turn with Nina and one with Steph as the rest looked on. A little later, Gloria came over and gave me a turn when Andy propped his feet up on the table and said, laughingly, enough, woman, and sent her my way. A slow dance started after the first one finished, and I was about to take her back to the table when she sat up, and we did a waltz with a little space between us. She asked me how I was doing as we danced. Her questions were pointed, but she said that she and Andy had been worried about me, and wanted to make sure that I was okay. I appreciated my friend's concerns, but to be quite honest, answering the questions truthfully was a little depressing, so I walked her back to the table and thanked her and Andy, before heading to the bar for a drink. I got in line and was looking out across the dance floor behind me when I saw Hallie coming toward the line. My heart raced more than it should have for a crush from 28 or 29 years earlier, but she was still as pretty as before, though obviously older. When she saw me, I waved and she smiled and waved back before her face went slack. I approached and said, Hi Hallie. Remember me. Her eyes dropped to the floor for a few moments before she looked up and nodded her head. Hi Tom. Of course I remember you, she said, opening her arms and biting a hug. I wasn't about to miss that opportunity, so I stepped in and hugged my old friend for the first time in ages. She fell good in my arms and I leaned my head against hers, enjoying the smell of her hair. Our hug lasted for several seconds before she squeezed tighter for a moment and relaxed. I took the hint and let go in return. How are you? I asked. 
She glanced around before turning back to look at me. Tom, can we get a drink and go sit somewhere to talk? In private. We got our drinks and went out in the lobby, wandering until we found an empty sofa. This okay? Sure, this is good, she replied, smiling. It's so loud in the ballroom that it's hard to think. And, Tom, I'm sorry, I need to think. First, I owe you an apology and an explanation. The wrong person routine you ran. What was that, seven or eight years ago? She nodded. I'm so sorry, Tom. I was so thrilled when I got your first message that I started typing immediately, but stopped as soon as I finished typing your name. She laughed. Three letters, T-O-M, was as far as I got before I realized what it would mean if my incredibly jealous husband found out. Delete, 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 with each one hurting, and my heart hurting non-stop over the next couple of days, until I finally replied to say that you had the wrong person. Then it hurt even worse. I'm sorry, Hallie, and I'm sorry I pressed you. I sighed before adding, I actually wondered later on, mind you if you really remembered, but just didn't want to reconnect because of your marriage. I'd have understood that and let it go. I should have, Tom, just admitted it, and said we can't be friends right now, but I needed a, oh, what's that term? Plausible deniability. Yes, that's it. Plausible deniability, in case Vince found out. We were going through a rough patch at the time. Are things good between you now? She took a deep breath and shook her head slowly. Things aren't anything between us now. We divorced three years ago after our son was in college. It's like we're in separate worlds, we don't talk except when there's something happening in Vinny's life. If he ever gets married, they may have to do two ceremonies, so Vince and I can each attend one. Ouch, I'm sorry. Trisha and I don't talk all that much these days either, but we still try to present a united front when it comes to Susie. She's a junior in college this year and is planning to continue on to become a veterinarian. We talked about the kids for a bit, but I could tell there was something on Hallie's mind. Hallie, what's wrong? Tom, do you ever think about, ah, what could have been? Yeah, sometimes, but I try not to dwell too much on cold to the shoulders that never were. Why? What's on your mind? I remember when you sent me that note, the last one, you said that you'd had a big crush on me. Tom, girls usually pick up some type of sign about such things, something, but I never got anything like that from you, no hints at all. Or maybe I was just blind because we were such good friends. Whatever, I've wondered many times what it might have been like if we'd taken a chance and gotten together, even for just one night. Hallie, you were a dear friend and I wanted to keep it that way. I hate to say it, but I still had some growing up to do back then, and yes, I had a big crush on you, but I was what you might call an equal opportunity crusher during freshman and so for more years when we were such good friends. I usually had crushes on a half dozen girls at a time before starting to figure things out later in college, including that one shouldn't have more than one crush at a time, but that was okay during the first two years, because it was pretty rare that any of them went anywhere. I chuckled, remembering some of the disasters. On the rare occasion when they did, it usually wasn't pretty, so rather than take a chance and lose you, I tried to hide my silly crush on you, admitting to one of the others occasionally as camouflage, in order to keep you in what youngsters of today sometimes call the friend zone. Hallie laughed. Tom, I think that term is well established, and maybe even old hat, today. We both chuckled, but I wanted to move on. Hallie, it doesn't matter now. If we're talking old hat, then it's like water over the dam, under the bridge, and a long, long way downstream. Hallie stared into my eyes before slowly shaking her head. No, Tom, it's not, and yes, it does matter. Take me upstairs to my room or your room and let's experience something new together. I've spent seven years or whatever wondering. Now I won't have to wonder anymore. She didn't have to ask twice, I took her hand and we made our way straight to the elevator. As soon as the doors closed, we were together, her hands gripping my jacket to make sure I wasn't slipping away and my hands cupping her face, loving her softness and the ferocity with which she kissed me. She slipped her heels off before we stepped off the elevator, and we practically ran, giggling, down the hallway to my room. There, I threw the latch as the door closed, and our kissing continued, with me trapped between Hallie and the wall, as she struggled with the buttons of my shirt. When she had it loose and pushed down my sleeves, I tossed it away and surprised her, unzipping her dress all the way down, and then picking her up and doing a 180, switching positions, so it was her turn to brace us against the wall. Tom, do you want a happy ending? I chuckled. Hallie, I always want a happy ending, but not necessarily what you're talking about. At least, not right now. No, I want you, Hallie, and I've wanted you all evening. I'm yours Tom. Make love to me. And I did. Falling on the bed beside her after tying off and tossing the condom, I slipped my arm over her, not wanting the moment or whatever we were feeling to end. 
It was much too early for it to be love, of course, but it was the culmination of the dream from many years before, and that made me even happier. Hallie's were still closed, but now, unlike before, they were relaxed, and she had a sweet smile on her face, as she continued to live what we just experienced. Her bliss made me smile as I held her, feeling her hair against my cheek and smelling a hint of flowers. Oh, Tom, why didn't we do this back then? She whispered. Why was I so blind as to not see it? And why were you so afraid to tell me? Bustard. She laughed. Seriously, we wasted years that we could have been together. SHH, don't say that Hallie. We had lives to lead, children to raise, but it's not too late to start now, to see where this might take us. Her eyes opened and she leaned over to kiss me. That's so true. I'm looking forward to where it takes us in the future, she said, but for now, I'm thinking a bit more short term. What do you mean? I'm wondering how long it will take you before you're ready to do that again Tom. We spent most of Saturday morning in bed together before doing brunch and getting to the game. Our tickets were for bleacher type seating in the same section, and there were a lot of people moving around, so we were able to sit together. The game was as tight as the seating, with the last second third and goal stopped by our defense winning the game for us by four. Since we've been a 7.5 point underdog, there was a lot of celebrating in the stadium, and as the reunion crowd made their way through campus and back to the hotel. Hallie went back to her room to change for dinner, so I did the same before going down to pick her up. When I knocked on her door, she opened it, grabbed my arm and pulled me inside. While it was only a lot of kissing and making out to avoid the need to shower, we almost missed our dinner reservation as a result. However, the smiles on our faces weren't missed by Mark and Jane at dinner, who had similar smiles of their own. Hallie and I went to the class party with our friends after dinner, we mingled for a while and danced before I caught the look in Hallie's eyes. I arched mine in response and she nodded with a prim smile, trying to hide the desire. We told everyone goodbye over the next little while, and then made our way back to the hotel in Hallie's room. Like the night before, we made love, but this time we were a lot more sure of ourselves and what we wanted. Our lovemaking was more fierce, almost primal, as our trust grew, and we enjoyed each other's body and our time together. Sometime after midnight as we readied for our third time and what I suspected would be the final time of the night, Hallie positioned herself on the bed on all fours and took my deck deep in her mouth, bobbing up and down for a bit to make sure I was ready. Whereas we watched each other's eyes on Friday night, this time she was focused on my deck, on what she could do for it, and on what it could do for and to her. Feeling me as hard as I could be, she let me go and spun around, still on all fours before spreading her knees. Dropping her forearm so her back angled down to the bed with her, she looked back at me and said, Tom, get your deck in me and duck me like there's no tomorrow. Hallie, wait. I'll make love to you in just a moment and as many more times as you want, and as hard and fast as you want it, to the absolute extent that I can, but I care far, far too much about you to ever just duck you. Do you know what I mean? She smiled and nodded. I think I do, Tom, and I think that's about the sweetest thing a guy has ever said to me. Now, I want you to shut up, put your deck in me, and duck me as hard and as fast as you can. Being our third time of the evening, it took a little while, but it wasn't too long before Hallie was saying decidedly on ladylike words of encouragement to me, over and over, that drove me on as I started to feel that wonderful tightening as my balls prepared to release their load. Perhaps it was Hallie's New Jersey heritage coming through again or maybe it was just that good, but she bowled out a long, duke, as she came for the last time and I blasted into her. Without me holding her, she collapsed on the bed but pulled me down partially on top of her. I moved to keep from crushing her, but then she was draped across me. Good God, Tom, she breathed, that was one of the best, most intensive ducks, ah, ducking lovemakings I've ever had. She was giggling as she said it, and then kissing me. Duck. We're going to have to get together sometime soon and do this again. With me in Dallas and her in New Jersey near Nick, we agreed to enjoy a reasonably steady but casual relationship, but she insisted that we avoid formalizing it or even falling in love, since our everyday lives were so far apart. Understanding, I agreed, but told her that we need to reevaluate that as time passed since I knew I already cared about her, and saw the possibility of more over time. Over the next few months, Hallie and I stayed in touch, talking two or three times a week and swapping text messages daily, but we were also able to get together about once a month. Wanting to prevent my Susie and her Vinny from finding out about us, we usually met in a neutral location where we could do a little touring, and then check into a good hotel with excellent room service, and a great bed, since that's where we spent much of our time. However, things didn't work out quite as we agreed. As our relationship continued, it grew and it wasn't long before I was falling in love with her as easily as I'd long suspected. Because we discussed it in advance, I held off on telling her, trying to decide what to do with my life and career, so we might have a real chance to be together all the time. 
Well, I wasn't keen on living in New Jersey or in New York City. I was becoming increasingly excited about the prospect of spending the rest of my life with Hallie, and I knew that living in her area was a sacrifice I'd gladly make, as she wasn't interested in coming with me to Dallas or some other neutral city. In May, we met in Charleston for the weekend. Considering that my flight had been delayed on Friday and that we'd spent Friday evening and Saturday morning making love, we hadn't even left the hotel yet, so I wasn't sure if it was a city we should consider if she wanted to go for the neutral side option. I pulled out my laptop and pulled up a list of local attractions I'd saved while preparing for the trip, in case I could talk her into going out. However, since it was a week before her birthday weekend, I'd arranged a spot trip with the works for her on Saturday afternoon. Hmm, <laughs> maybe she'll have other ideas, I said aloud to myself. That wouldn't necessarily be a bad. A phone rang, seemingly in our room. The ringtone wasn't mine or Hallie's so I looked for it, but it stopped before I could find it. I kept looking, but the sound had been low and muffled, so I was about to give up when it started ringing again. Since I was close this time, within two or three rings I decided that it was definitely in our room, and that someone must have dropped it behind or maybe inside the dresser, possibly behind a drawer. Continuing the search, I found it in one of the drawers, under Hallie's clothes. It wasn't Hallie's phone so I picked it up, wondering who'd left it behind, and how she'd missed it when she put her clothes in the drawer. Considering we were leaving on Sunday, she hadn't brought all that much in the first place. Since it wasn't ringing anymore, I figured I'd take it to the front desk, and maybe they'd be able to track down the owner after I confirmed with Hallie that it wasn't a phone for her work. I put it down and returned to my laptop once more, but a series of dings caused me to go over and pick it up again. I couldn't unlock it, of course, but there were some partial text messages on the screen, and another popped in as I looked at them, trying to get a clue. V. WTF are you? Or not at her sisters? V. Had to trick it out of her, but Trudy says you haven't. Trudy. That was Hallie's sister's name. We hadn't met, but Hallie had mentioned her a couple of times. V. You better be home when I get there so. V. Call me now. Some time later, I was still sitting on the edge of the bed where I'd slumped down when the door opened, and Hallie came in, practically dancing. Oh Tom. Thank you so much, that was the Tom. What's wrong? She must have thought I had a stroke or something, but when I held up the phone for her to see, the color drained from her face, and she appeared to deflate before my eyes. It was ringing, Hallie. And ringing. I guess you forgot to turn it off. She was shaking her head in denial, tears streaming down her face. No. God, no. What kind of wicked game are you playing Hallie? Letting me fall in love with you when you have someone else. Another lover. A husband. That's what it is, isn't it? God, Hallie, what have you done? If you're still married, you have to know this can never be. Tom, no. It's not what it seems. Oh, really? So it's not your husband? Like, the one you divorced? Or, evidently, didn't? Or did you just remarry and forget to tell me about that part? She tried to hug me, to wrap her arms around me like she'd wrapped me in her web of lies. I got up and turned away, not wanting to touch her or let her touch me. Oh, Dr. Tom. Please. It is, it's Finn's, but, but it's not what you think. Oh, really? I repeat incredulously. So all the time I've been falling in love with you hasn't been a complete lie. I growled, trying to keep from shouting. And we're not ducking adulterers, the lowest scum on earth like Trisha and her ducking friend. Please, tell me no, because, I'll tell you, that's sure the way it's looking to me right now, and I'm so sick about it, I'm about to puke. And if I can hold lunch down, I'm thinking about walking out that door and never looking back. Tom, please. Let me explain. Please. Okay, but only because I love you, Hallie, or, at least, I did. I'm not sure now, but I'm all ears, so tell me the truth. No more lies. She was sitting on the bed again, grasping her hands together like trying to rub off the guilt that coated them like blood. The tears were still coming, but she was at least looking me in the eyes as she said, Tom, I'm so sorry, but this is the truth, the god-awful truth. Vince and I had been having trouble for a long, long time when you contacted me nearly eight years ago. We were basically still together because of Vinny, our son. I was in couples therapy then, but he wasn't, and it wasn't getting us anywhere. Eventually, it was so bad that I realized I had to divorce him, so I got an attorney and tried, but Vince pulled out the prenup I'd signed 17 years before, and told me that he'd be enforcing it to the letter. I'd end up with basically nothing. Oh, there would be some money, of course, but nothing like I was used to. So you're a gold digger, too? No. Not like that. You see, Vince had a tight prenup, but he also had Rafael Bonaduce, who's one of the biggest divorce attorneys in the state. You know, rich people who want to stay rich and celebrities. I got some young lady fresh out of law school who was so green and scared, she probably pissed her panties the first time she met Mr. Bonaduce. 
When we work out the terms of what I'd get, I'd have been a pauper again, Vince would have been laughing all the way to the bank, and Mr. Bonaduce would have probably been ducking my young Miss Attorney actually. With his reputation, I suspect he probably was by the time we were done anyway. A ducking gold digger, I repeated, convinced by her own words. And it sounds like your attorney is one too. Well, birds of a feather, I guess. No? Vincent de Primo is big in his family business. Car dealerships, rentals, insurance, and real estate, and the like, divorce looks bad to them. He agreed to let me have some freedom as long as I'm discreet about it, and give him plausible deniability. And that I'm there to take care of his needs whenever he wants. I've been telling him I'm going to see my sister Trudy or to a conference or something. Since I'm away, that gives him the freedom to do, well, whatever, for the weekend, but I guess something came up this time. Yeah, his deck, I suspect. It needed servicing, I'm sure. She grimaced, admitting with her facial expression that it was probably true, and I swallowed hard to keep from hurling right there. I'm so sorry Tom. I still want to divorce him, but I just haven't had the resources or the fallback position that I need to do it. I've been wanting to tell you, but I didn't want you to react like this. A lunch, safe again for at least a few seconds, I gave a sigh of disgust. Hallie, you knew my feelings and that I'd react just like this, but you did it anyway. What the hell were you thinking? If you just told me the truth from the start, we might have worked on this together and worked something out. Now, I don't know. I'm so confused, finding that I love you and I hate you at the exact same time. I'm, ah, I've got to go. Tom, please, stay. Tonight. Let's talk this out, please. Hallie, I'm sorry, but while you're still married, there's nothing to talk about. And, I hate to say it, but if you divorce your husband and come calling for me, I'm not sure if there will be anything to say even then. I thought you'd become my best friend in addition to my lover, but you've proven yourself a cheater and a liar, and someone I honestly don't know as well as I thought. To make matters worse, I don't know if I'll ever be able to trust you again. No, I'm sorry, Hallie, but I've got to leave and think about this. She cried and pleaded as I packed, seemingly promising me the moon and the stars if I'd stick by her, but I knew I wasn't her lapdog, as much as I'd loved her or her duck toy, despite how she ducked me and her husband over. Within five minutes, I had my things packed and was walking out the door as I tried to ignore her begging and crying. There was a huge hole in my heart as I flew home and in the days that followed. When we'd met again after so many years at the reunion, I knew from the start that there was a chance of falling in love with Hallie. It was even harder after we'd gotten together and made love so many times that weekend, but I tried to be smart and avoid it. Considering how far apart we lived, I hadn't even wanted to, but it happened despite the odds and my wishes. Yes, I'd come to love her and, in truth, still did but my world was a disaster, and was on fire with a flame she'd lit, both in my heart for her and in the rubble around me, that threatened to destroy the person I'd always thought myself to be. I shook my head, wondering what to do and how to come through with honor, dignity, and love or any combination thereof. Remembering that we were already adulterers, I realized that the chance for honor and dignity were already gone. Love, on the other hand. I wanted to keep loving her, but really didn't know if I could even if she wanted me to. I was extremely angry with her and on edge about where we might be going if she chose to divorce her husband. If not, I knew I'd never see her again. I typed her a long email, putting my raw emotions into reasoned thoughts and those thoughts onto the virtual paper of the computer screen. It took a week of typing and retyping, editing and re-editing a bit at a time, before I finally felt it was close enough that I could press send. At the end of the message, I told her to contact me if she started the divorce proceedings, or if she made up her mind to just stay with her husband, if neither of those things occurred, I'd be back in touch in a few weeks. That it would probably be the last time wasn't stated, but if she couldn't read between the lines, she wasn't nearly as smart as I thought. My work became my life for the next few weeks, not so much because it needed to be, but for the distraction from my problem named Hallie, and the guilt that I felt for violating the moral code that I'd always followed. That changed one weekend in June when Susie came to visit. I've missed you, Dad. You've seemed so distracted in the past few months, even when we talk on the phone I'm not sure if you're really paying attention to the discussion, or if you're off in your own little world, and I'm just a minor interference somewhere along the edge. What's going on? She was right. I hadn't been ignoring her, but I hadn't been paying as much attention to her needs as I had in the past, due to the problems in my life. Sweetheart, your mom and I always tried to teach you to do the right thing, but, unfortunately, we haven't always been the best examples. I don't want to get into the details because it wasn't intentional, but I did something recently that wasn't right and may have hurt someone else. Her head bobbed. Dad, I'm 21 now, remember? When I had a problem with liking two guys last year, mom admitted to me that she'd made a bad mistake with you. 
You both tried to protect me from the truth back when it happened, but mom said I needed to hear it now that I'm grown so I could learn from her duck up yes. Don't look at me like that, that's exactly what she called it and hopefully not repeat it in my life. I had to make a decision before I did something like she did. I learned from her duck up and did the right thing. You're not going to deny me that teaching moment, are you? I looked at her, thankful we'd raised such a good young woman, even if she was sometimes too inquisitive. She put her hand on mine and asked, what happened, dad? I hadn't planned to share my mistake with anyone, particularly not my daughter, but it was a good life lesson for her that might reinforce what Trisha had told her, and might even help her someday. I took a deep breath and plunged in. I ran into an old friend, we hit it off, and we fell in love over the next few months. Then, when I was planning to talk to her about making it permanent, I found out that she wasn't as divorced as she claimed after all. Ouch. She lied to you. And cheated on her husband. Now, even though you didn't know, you feel guilty about it. Right dad? Susie had always been as smart as a whip, being on track to graduate summa cum laude the following year. She'd just proven it again. Yeah, that pretty much sums it up. I might add that she claims her husband is a cheating scumbag, too, but two wrongs don't make a right, we finished together, proving that Susie also remembered that often taught lesson from her childhood. Dad, it wasn't right, but it wasn't intentional, and you stopped when you found out, right? Yeah. But, I'm not sure where we're going from here. That's what you should be concerned about then, not about what happened in the past. Like I said, smart kid. A few days later, I received a call from Trisha. Is Susie okay? I asked hurriedly, worried due to the unexpected timing of the call. Yes, she's fine, Tom, but she seemed worried about you. She wouldn't give me any details, but I just wanted to make sure you're okay. Trisha, I'm fine. It's no big deal. I should have shut up there and, possibly, thanked her for calling, but we'd shared a lot over the years, and it slipped out. I made a mistake recently and it, ah, hasn't been fun living with it. I'm sorry. Want to talk about it? No, I don't, I paused. Well, yeah, maybe. Can I ask you a very personal question? She chuckled. We've asked each other a lot of very personal questions over the years. I think this is the first time you've ever asked if you can ask. Go for it. When you had the affair, did you ever feel guilty? Whoa. That really is personal. And unexpected. Sorry. You don't have to answer. I'll talk to you later, okay? Tom, wait. I, ahem, I want to answer. I was a big girl and I was intelligent enough to know that what I was doing was wrong, and that it would hurt you and hurt us if it ever got out. Unfortunately, the temptation was strong and I wasn't, not strong enough to resist it that first time anyway. Once I stepped over that line I'd never planned to cross, that not made me braver, but maybe emboldened me. To keep doing it. I knew I shouldn't do it, and yes, I felt guilty and dirty as a result, but I got the extra thrill and thought it would be okay until I messed up and you caught me. It was a relief, in a way, but when it came time to pay the consequences, the cost was a lot higher than I expected, and, well, I'm still paying for them and regretting the choice every day. I'm really sorry, Tom, for what I did to you and to us. I'm sorry for the trust I took away. Thanks, Trisha, for being honest with me. Now, anyway. What's wrong, Tom? Why are you asking this now? You're not married, but wait. Are you seeing someone who is? was seeing someone, and we were getting very close, but then the truth came out, and now I realize that I'm an adulterer, too, though not by choice. Tom, don't blame yourself if you didn't know. I made a choice, a really bad, stupid choice in hindsight, but if you didn't know she was married, you can't blame yourself for something you did. Yeah, I keep telling myself that. It's not working too well so far. Not if you don't let it. Tom, just remember though, you do know now, so you're responsible for any choices you make now from here on out. That may seem tough, but I've known you for a long time, honey, and I know you'll make the right ones. The days passed and I heard nothing from Hallie, so I started writing a message to her, something that would tell her how I felt, and that this was goodbye. Similar to old movies where the guy has a pile of crumpled notes tossed around through a stethoscope, I felt that the recycle bin on my computer would have been littered with my failed efforts, except for the ability to edit on screen without actually wasting the paper. I was busy editing yet another version one evening after work when my doorbell rang. A man in a really well-tailored suit stood in front of the door, with two other men really big men, in fact in suits standing at the bottom of the stairs on the sidewalk looking up my way. Dressed identically in suits that didn't fit so well and with the same lucky features of a professional defensive lineman, I immediately imagined a bolt up version of the old Bobsy twins. I opened the door slightly and said, may I help you? Mr. Jarrett, my name is Vincent De Primo. We've never met, but my understanding is that you know my wife Hallie. Quite well, I believe. 
We need to talk. May I come in? Mr. DePrimo, I'm sorry, but now's not a good time. Mr. Jared, I'm here from New Jersey. My boys and I would really appreciate it if you would make the time and invite me in, rather than forcing the issue. Now. I imagined the bird in Anne's seat behind him could knock the door off the hinges with ease if he ordered it, so I said, ahem, come in, Mr. DePrimo. I opened the door and allowed him in, and then shut it behind him before the bulksy twins could make it up the stairs. If they kept coming and hit the door as I knew they could, I'd have a home invasion case, though I hoped that they wouldn't, and that I wouldn't need a reason to try to defend myself. Or rebuild my house, if I ever recovered. Fortunately, he nodded to the boys as the door was closing, and they nodded back in reply, stopping about halfway up the steps. The dead bull clicked a moment later and I turned to him. Please, come in the living room and have a seat. May I offer you some coffee, tea, soda? After a moment, I added, or maybe scotch. His face, a mask of seriousness to this point, finally broke a smile, and he looked just a bit relaxed for the first time. Scotch sounds like an excellent choice, Mr. Jared. I stepped over to the cabinet to open the door, revealing a small bar inside. Pouring each of us a glass, I handed one to him and asked, What can I do for you, Mr. Tuprimo? Is Holly okay? He took a good sniff of the Macallan in his glass before taking a sip. Very nice, Mr. Jared. Thank you. And, Hallie. She's fine, though she doesn't know I'm here. We're currently in couples counseling after the stunt she pulled. For seven or eight months, she usually told me she was going to see her sister in Ohio each month, when she wasn't off to a conference, but, other than the trip to Cleveland, in what April, I don't think she stepped foot in Ohio during the entire time, and she never saw Trudy except over Christmas when she came to us. He took another sip of the scotch, savoring it for a moment before letting it slide down. Which brings us to my reason for being here, Mr. Jared. I have one question for you. In your association with her, did you ever duck my wife? He was looking right into my eyes, and I'm sure he knew the truth, but I stared back at him with as much resoluteness as I could muster. I recalled Hallie's comment, when she finally admitted to her situation, that she'd mentioned something about plausible deniability. I hoped she hadn't been lying to me then like so many of her other lies. I also remembered what I'd told her. Mr. DePrimo, Hallie was an old and dear friend, for whom I cared a great deal. I was, ah, mistaken, about her marital status, but I assure you, I did care for her, and I would never, ever duck her. I continued to stare at him, hoping he'd believe my truth as I presented it, for although Hallie and I had enjoyed sex together many times, I considered it making love because of the way I felt for her, and not plain old ducking just for the fun of it. Then Supremo stared at me for the longest time before finally picking up his glass, throwing the last of the scotch back, and setting it down rather hard on the coffee table between us. Good, he said. Now that's settled, there's just one other point. For now, Mr. Jared, Hallie is my wife. While we've had our share of problems over the years, I hope it stays that way, and that you'll take my advice and stay the duck away from her from now on. If I even hear a hint that you two are seeing each other again, or communicating in any way well, let's just say you won't like the result.